I hate when I go to a movie and I expect to be entertained by the artist's hard work as he endeavors to do so, but instead I get a truckload of political hogwash. I mean, okay, I understand. Everyone's entitled to their opinion and they should be entitled to express it. This is America. But unless it's a movie explicitly about politics, I don't want to hear your opinion about politics! I mean, come on! I didn't go into Finding Nemo expecting to see Marlin and Dory wander through the ocean as they look for him and all of a sudden stop and go off on a rant about how evil George Bush is. I mean, come on guys, he's been out of politics for five years, give it a rest. I mean, unlike Al Gore who, he won't go, he won't stop droning on about how our SUVs are the root of all evil and uh, all this despite the fact that his uh, carbon footprint is much larger than any one person should be. There you go again, being a hypocrite. I was making a point. That's annoying! Well, first thing you've gotten right so far... <sighs> so, a movie that's intentionally political is going to be a tricky bugger indeed then, isn't it? Especially a movie like The American Carol, which conservative political people should have flocked to. I mean, that should have done really well, right? Right? I mean, especially with someone like David Zucker at the helm. What? The guy that directed the uh, airplane movies and the Naked Gun series? Yeah, yeah. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Well, he also did the third and fourth scary movie, so... Well, I guess that's not a very good example now, is it? You're dead to me. Now, having said that about conservatives and how they should have flocked to this movie, I've got a personal bone to pick with this one. I mean, I admit I'm a conservative myself by nature. By admitting that, I probably lost about half of you. But, you know, I listen to these talk radio people and hear their recommendations on movie every now and then and been pleasantly surprised by most of them. So, going in to see An American Carol, I thought, well, this ought to be another winner, right? Well, it almost goes without saying, but... Yeah, that basically sums up how I felt about the movie. I mean, like I said, I trusted these guys. They've give, given good recommendations before. So, going into this and seeing how awful it was, and, and taking my family to it, ugh. I've never been so wrong in all my life. <laughs> well, what's about that time when you... Not a word out of you. Oh, do you mean when he reviewed the Rocketeer? Oh my word. That was a test of patience now, wasn't it? I, mean, I feel horrible for his roommates who he begged to go and watch it. Ah. <sighs> That's it. I um, uh, never have I been so wrong. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> now let's see, an American Carol. What a piece of work this one is. Let's just say that this is yet another piece of evidence why big names don't always make a movie great. They can certainly help. But unless you're a die-hard David Zucker fan, I'd stay away from this one. In fact, I can't really recommend it to hardcore David Zucker fans either. Unless you 
really like to see Michael Moore getting slapped in the face constantly. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean Michael Malone. No, seriously, that's all that happens to this guy in this movie. Look! <laughs> Hey, what are you doing here? You're not a spirit. I know. I just enjoy slapping you. I mean, I disagree with and rather enjoy poking fun at Michael Moore whenever he shows up in the news and constantly drones on about how broken and evil America is and corrupt it is, despite having used the very system that he loathes to get rich and getting sidetracked again, are we? Sorry, guys. But, you know, two words come to mind here. Dead horse. But that's not the worst of it. Oh, no. There's more. Lots more. Like the slutty girlfriend pointing out that he's fat. He has no concept of personal hygiene, and you know, you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just get into the movie, and you'll see what I'm talking about, okay? Assuming you didn't understand from the title, and I don't know how you could have missed it, but this is supposed to be an Americanized adaptation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. But just in case you did miss it, they quickly remind you and say that the story really doesn't work in July. But. Grandpa Nielsen fortunately has a backup story about an American Scrooge who hates America instead of Christmas. But we don't start with Mr. Malone, oh no. We start in Afghanistan where a small group of terrorists realize that the recruitment video isn't very good. Wait, what? That training video wasn't very good? Are you kidding me? No, nope. dead serious. Serious? They need a, a video to to motivate these people to blow themselves up. I mean, are you are you telling me the 722 Virgin thing isn't enough anymore? I mean, what do you mean to tell me these guys are sitting on a fence, twiddling their thumbs and saying, you know, I, I, I wish we could get, go blow up infidels, but I, I, I don't know how. If only there was some, you know, quick five-minute video training us about. Ways to get the job done. I, I do it in a heartbeat. But, but there's not, so I guess I'll just sit here. Good heavens, people. Do you, do you think I'm that dense? Stop bringing common sense into the movie. You'll ruin everything. We can't have any of that now, can we? So, desperately needing an America-hating Hollywood director, which they believe there is an absolute abundance of in Hollywood, that finally brings us to Michael Malone, a fat, stupid, America-hating quote-unquote director who nobody likes, but constantly lives under the delusion that everyone loves his films. He's got a bit of a problem because he is well known for hating all that America stands for, but he has an America-loving nephew named Josh. Josh comes by to invite him to their 4th of July barbecue, but is flatly turned down by Michael, since he has much more important things going on, like abolishing the 4th of July. Oh, come on, for crying out loud. Abolish the 4th of July? I mean, what's next? He's gonna write a script about fascist America? Fascist America? Oh, you shut up. Josh mentions that the offer still stands and walks off singing My Country Tis of Thee because that's normal. Whatever. Not letting this affect him, he heads off to the film award ceremony that he hosts but still can't seem to win the top prize where he runs into two dummy terrorists who try to recruit him on the spot to make a movie for inspiring the final jihad. Sorry to stop again, but come on people. They, they went, they're supposed to go to Hollywood to look for a Hollywood director. Michael Malone's in New York. I mean, okay, they got Broadway there, but what are they going to do? Are they going to try to get the director of Cats or a Phantom of the Opera? Try to get inspiration from them? My word. 
After a few quick turn of events, Michael agrees to produce the film for the terrorists, which he doesn't actually know are terrorists. You, sir, are an idiot. Going home to unwind for the evening, he switches to JFK's inaugural address, and somehow JFK hears him, comes out of the TV, and tells him it's time for a visit from Three Spirits to help him change his ways. Michael quickly writes this off until the next morning where he meets his first spirit, General George S. Patton. Patton tries explaining to Michael that even though war isn't always desirable, it has had many positive benefits in changing the course of world history. One of the biggest he points out being the fact that if Lincoln hadn't won the war, we would still have slavery. Oh no. You didn't. Master Malone! Master Malone! I had the boys polish up your trophies like you told us. Polish my trophy? Yep, you did. You know, what kills me about this scene is that Michael is supposed to be a huge slave owner. And you see him acting like he's completely opposed to the idea. But for a few brief moments, you can see that he's rather stoked about it. And even though this is a movie, I'm sure there's a huge group of people out there when they heard about this scene, flip their crap about how racist this is. This is a work of fiction and comedy, people. I mean, come on. If Chris Rock was up there making jokes about this kind of stuff, he'd all laugh. But since it's likely a bunch of white people that do this, Oh no, can't have none of that now, can we? I mean, imagine what would happen to me if I tried to do some kind of joke like that. So, let me tell you something about those black people. Oh, let me. Be nice. What did I do? I mean, I was just... Pain! Those are pain! <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Continuing on their journey to point out how problematic Michael's thinking is, and those that think like him, they move on to a university to make their point with the musical number. Nope! Not gonna make you suffer through that. Fast forward. Uh... General Patton still can't seem to figure out why Michael hasn't seen the light, so they have a flashback to a love story sequence, because a Christmas Carol had one, so an American Carol needs one too. And this scene doesn't make sense, because Michael's already bound and determined to show how evil America is by going to film school, which he flunks out after one month after attending, so he can learn how to make movies about it, because listening to someone drone on about this isn't very funny to listen to. So he goes off to do this and comes back to find that his girlfriend was so turned off by the idea, she went ahead and turned into a massive slut and slept with everyone that had two legs and wore a uniform. And we're supposed to think that this just pushed him over the cliff and gave him the motivation to make crappy documentaries about how evil America is when they already told us that he hated America. <laughs> I wish this movie would just die. Huh? Why the slow motion shot? And why is Leslie Nielsen killing people in the background? You know what? Forget it. General Patton comes back and... Wait, why is he still here? Shouldn't we have moved on to the second spirit by now? Guess that didn't fit into the story too well, so forget that too. He comes back to pull Michael into a battle to defend the courthouse from... Zombies? Wait, L ACLU zombies? Why the hell are members of the ACLU zombies that don't try to eat people? They just hand out pamphlets and bore other people into becoming zombies? What's going on here? What, why is the judge more annoyed at this instead of being afraid for his life? Why are we suddenly in Josh's backyard meeting all the severely handicapped children? Why is this little girl on dialysis? 
Oh, sorry. Having trouble trying to keep up? Well, don't worry. The movie's almost over. So, Michael meets George Washington, who tells him only the truth will matter on Judgment Day, which he quickly blows off before running into the Angel of Death. He shows him that if he doesn't stop doing what he's doing, he'll die. Then, as if the tombstone wasn't enough, he sees that eventually he'll be reduced to a giant gel buttocks in his dorky hat, which snaps him out of his hatred for America immediately, but then he remembers he has a demonstration to go to, but since that he's had this change of heart, the whole thing quickly falls apart. And remember the terrorists? Well, somewhere along the line, they decided that they didn't actually want him to do the movie. Well, actually, their leader decided that. And he decides that they should instead die as martyrs by blowing up Madison Square Gardens. The two cohorts decide that they really don't want to die, so they tell Michael the plot, and he jumps up on stage and lures Aziz out by asking everyone that who hates America to stand up. Which somehow works. Well, the two cohorts rush in and stop the bomb by h hitting it. Then Michael goes on to make a feature with JFK, God Bless America, th the end. Oh boy. What a headache this one was. I mean, come on people, what is this? A movie about a bunch of terrorists that want to make a better training video and then change their mind and decide they want to blow up a famous American monument and then have another change of heart and turn into filmmakers. I mean, what what is going on here? I mean, led by Michael Malone, who has the quickest change of heart only because he was threatened with death. And you, you think that can conversion is going to last? I mean... And that's not even half of the nonsense they expect you to swallow. I mean, Michael not realizing that these people are terrorists. Bill O'Reilly showing up doing a special news segment um, with Rosie O'Connell. Um, Michael accidentally knocking all of Josh's children into the bay and killing them. And it, you know what? I don't care. The movie is over, and I'll I'll never have to do another blatantly political movie ever again. point out the horrible lip syncing at the end. Come on, people. We'll try a bit here, but you know, I have seen worse. Monkey! Ah! Oh my god! Monkey! Monkey! What unholy terror is this? It's like she's possessed by a demon or she's become some kind of wooden puppet. The eyes, they're flat and lifeless like a doll's eyes. And what is with the lip flaps? Monkey! It's like the word monkey's got six syllables all of a sudden. Monkey! 